Thank you so much for the nice introduction. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about a very important uh, mineral that we usually forget and don't focus on, which is uh, magnesium, especially in patients with uh, chronic kidney disease. There is a growing evidence that magnesium is very essential to our CKD patients. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee and uh, um, the chairperson for the nice introduction and for the invitation. And I think I need to say that I don't have anything to disclose uh, for uh, my talk today. The objective of my talk is I'll be um, going to uh, try to convince you about the importance of the magnesium as one of the most important minerals in our body. We'll talk about the uh, magnesium homeostasis, the role of magnesium in our CKD patients regarding its role as a cardiovascular calcification inhibitor. Is there is any data about uh, the relationship between magnesium and uh, um, survival of our CKD patients. And if there is uh, also uh, an important role of magnesium in suppression or slowing down the progression of the CKD. And the last um, focus will be on the bone loss. Do you have any evidence that magnesium is good or bone for our patient's bone? So let's talk a little bit about um, magnesium homeostasis. So the average magnesium intake uh, is about 360 milligram per day. We um, absorb only 120 milligram of this magnesium and we excrete uh, about 260 milligram in the stool. So this 100 milligram goes to the blood. Then the kidney excretes the majority of this and uh, whatever left which is about 20 milligram a day um, is mainly stored in the muscles and in the bone and inside our cells. So here is a bone part of the magnesium, about 60, 65% of our magnesium intake goes straight to the bone. The majority of the extraskeleton magnesium stays inside the cells and the very small fraction, 1%, is in the extracellular space. As we know that 99% of our calcium is stored in the bone and about 85% of our phosphorus are stored in bone and 60% of magnesium stored in bone. So bone is a major reservoir and storage for our minerals uh, when it comes to calcium, phosphorus, hydroxyapatite, and magnesium and the rest is mainly intercellular. It's very important for all kinds of cell function. And the problem with the extracellular uh, fluid and extracellular concentration of these uh, minerals, it's only constituted because it's uh, mainly an intercellular and bone elements. So the extracellular uh, component is very small. And when we measure the magnesium level, we don't have any idea about the bone magnesium. We don't have any idea about the serial magnesium, which are both constitute about 99% of the uh, magnesium in our body, but we only get um, magnesium level from the serum, which is the extra serial component, which only constitute about 1% of our magnesium. Magnesium is very, very important to our body. More than 600 enzymes need magnesium to be biologically active. Magnesium is very essential in most of the enzymatic function, especially the kinases, the ATPases, the phosphofructokinase, ATPase, adenylcyclase, very important uh, enzyme substrate. It's also very important in nucleic acid and protein synthesis and mitochondrial function. A uh, very uh, pivotal element in our cell membrane. So for all of our cell function, it's a very important uh, mineral. And also in our neuromuscular and cardiovascular system, it's very, very essential. Actually, it has 
a calcium channel blocking effect. So actually it can lower also the blood pressure. The renal handling of uh, the magnesium have been mainly in the thick uh, uh, segment of the ascending loop of uh, Henle. And actually the magnesium deficiency can induce functional or pseudo hypoparathyroidism. And about 77% of cases of hypocalcemia, they have um, magnesium deficiency and about 50% of hypokalemic patients, they have magnesium, magnesium deficiency. So if you have a patient with hypocalcemia or hypokalemia, make sure to correct the hypomagnesemia because you're not going to correct the hypocalcemia or hypokalemia without correcting the hypomagnesemia. We know that there is a lot of uh, symptoms and signs of uh, hypomagnesemia, which usually resemble the hypocalcemia. Um, especially on the cardiovascular system, you know, torsade de bois, a lot of uh, um, SVTs and arrhythmias that can happen with the prolonged PURS complex, the hypokalemia and the hypocalcemia that usually happen with the severe hypomagnesemia, which is usually intractable to therapy, um, cramps, fasciculation, carbobidal spasm, seizures can happen from hypomagnesemia. Um, CNS, you know, peripheral and central nervous system, you know, including depression, in, including sensory and motor um, uh, deficits, encephalopathy, um, aphasia, and uh, altered mental status, even paralysis that can happen. However, most importantly, magnesium deficiency in general can induce muscle pain, muscle weakness, tiredness, fatigue. Um, and also bone beans, you know, myalgia, arthralgia, all these kinds of symptoms can be related to magnesium deficiency. The main cause of mag magnesium deficiency is in the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and in this case, the urinary uh, magnesium will be low, less than one millimole per day. And a lot of reason for gastrointestinal losses, including nausea, vomiting, malabsorption, uh, bowel resection, malnutrition, severe pancreatitis. Use of proton bomb inhibitor is one of the major causes because it's very common uh, to be used in, uh, nowadays. Um, so the majority of losses happen in the GI. However, also there is renal losses. Renal losses usually happen either because of osmotic polyuria. So uh, in patients who have urinary diversion or urinary tract obstruction, patients who has DKA or hyperosmolar hyperglycemia, and there is a lot of uh, other causes that can induce either direct or indirect magnesium transport inhibition and uh, induce hypomagnesemia. Uh, Most importantly, medication like aminoglycoside, cisplatin, uh, calcineuria inhibitors, the cyclosporin and the prograph we use in many um, cases with um, after renal transplantation or with GN. Alcohol, you know, especially in alcoholics, metabolic acidosis also um, decrease the extra serum uh, magnesium concentration. Hypercalcemia, so hypercalcemia induced hypomagnesemia, then hypomagnesemia induced hypocalcemia. This is called a uh, closed negative feedback mechanism. Lube and uh, thiazide diuretics both increases the magnesium excretion in the urine. Volume expansion, especially if patient is getting a lot of volume resuscitation, several uh, liters of IV fluid without magnesium or TPN without magnesium, all can induce um, hypomagnesemia. There is a um, rare uh, familial hypomagnesemia with hypercalciuria and nephrocalcinosis that can induce kidney failure in children because of extensive uh, calcification and nephrocalcinosis uh, that happen because of collodene 16 or collodene 19 loss of function mutation. Now let us focus on magnesium and CKD patients. So for several decades, we thought that our patients have tendency to have hyper magnesemia CKD patients, they retain magnesium as they retain potassium and they retain the phosphorus. However, the 
hypomagnesemia prevalence is only, uh, you know, it, it's, it's about 15% on, in our advanced CKD division. So actually the problem with hypomagnesemia is more than a problem of hypermagnesemia. Uh, I'm trying to convince you with this. And also the other concept I want to leave you with is absence of hypomagnesemia doesn't necessarily mean adequate total body magnesium. The person can be um, deficient in magnesium without having hypomagnesemia, because as we mentioned, only 1% of our magnesium uh, is the component that we can measure from the serum uh, that is the uh, extracellular magnesium. However, we cannot measure the bone and we cannot measure the intercellular magnesium. So hypomagnesemia and in general, magnesium deficiency, even without having lower serum magnesium is not uncommon in our CKD patient. The problem with hypermagnesemia uh, is also minimized. And uh, the problem happened because the active component of the magnesium is the ionized form of magnesium. So in our CKD patient, especially prior to dialysis, there is significant decrease of ionized calcium level. So the ionized to the total magnesium level goes down. So even if the total magnesium level is high, the biologically active magnesium, which is the ionized form, is still low. So the prevalence of hypermagnesemia now is down from 69% to 13% in patients with advanced CKD. So the problem of hypomagnesemia is much higher than the problem of hypermagnesemia in our CKD patients. For several decades, we didn't focus on magnesium as an important uh, um, biomarker and predictor of our um, CKD patients' outcome. But as you see here in the last decade or a decade and a half, there is a growing evidence, there is increased publication that start to focus on magnesium as part of the CKD MBD um, um, cascade. In the just last couple of years, you see a lot of uh, publication coming in, magnesium as new player in CKD, emerging rule of uh, magnesium in CKD this was just published this month. Magnesium and all the player revisited in the context of CKD MBD. Magnesium is a novel member of CKD MBD family. So now there is a lot of attention and focus on magnesium in our CKD patients. And we are going to talk about four outcomes. Can magnesium affect the cardiovascular calcification? Can it improve our patient survival? Can it affect the progression of our CKD patients? Can it induce bone loss or improve bone health? So first of all, let us, and by the way, I bought this order because the, you know, there is much more evidence that magnesium can inhibit cardiovascular calcification. So I bought this first, according to the level of evidence we have. So when it comes to magnesium and cardiovascular calcification, we have very high evidence and very good RCTs that showed higher magnesium and giving magnesium to our CKD patient might improve their outcome. Then we have, you know, maybe medium or intermediate evidence about the mortality and about the progression of the CKD, then we have low level of evidence about the relationship between magnesium and the bone. So let's start with the cardiovascular calcification. Magnesium actually inhibits the vascular muscle cell calcification. It has calcium antagonizing effect. It induces vasodilatation and decreases peripheral vascular resistance. It also improves the endothelial function as it, it it increases the nitric oxide, prostaglandin 2, so the vasodilator uh, prostaglandin and uh, nitric oxide. It decreases the interleukin 1, interleukin 6, and it improves the platelet adhesion and decreases the free radical production. 
on the heart, it has anti-ischemic effects and of course, anti-arrhythmic effects. I'm not going to go in details uh, on those. Let's just focus on magnesium as one of the uh, most potent uh, uh, calcification inhibitor to our CKD patient, especially medial calcification. You see this calcification is particularly CKD cal related calcification because intimate calcification can happen to non-CKD patient because of other traditional risk factor for atherosclerosis, then intimate uh, proliferation and uh, bleed formation that rupture then calcifies. But in our CKD patients, the pathogenesis is different because the muscular smooth muscle cells, the medial layer is getting calcified. So magnesium actually inhibits this calcification and I'm going to convince you with the evidence we have. Calcification usually start by amorphous calcium phosphate crystal, which is, can be soluble and the serum doesn't induce any injury, especially in presence of fat one. So in our CKD patient, we have excess phosphate, excess calcium. So calcium and phosphate uh, form clusters that is initially combined with a fat one and it's very amorphous, it dissolve, it's very soluble in our serum. This induce something called calcium protein particle one or primary calcium protein particle, which is uh, not crystalline, it's um, still amorphous, still soluble in our serum. The problem happens if we have excess uh, phosphorus or if we have less magnesium, this calcium protein particle matures from the primary to a secondary calcium protein particle. This secondary calcium protein particle doesn't only increase the cardiovascular calcification, but also induce oxidative stress and induce inflammation and initiate kidney injury and kidney damage. Here is a primary C CCP is a calcium protein particle. It's amorphous, it doesn't hurt the tissue. The secondary form when it matures uh, in absence of fat or in, you know, if the fat level is low or magnesium level of, is low or in presence of more phosphorus, it matures and start to crystallize and induce this needle shaped crystal deposition in the vascular smooth muscle cells. Without magnesium, you see the maturation of the hydroxyapatite crystals, which are big and they induce zanidas for cardiovascular calcification. When you put magnesium in the media, magnesium inhibit calcium phosphate crystallization. In the rat model, if you put them in a low dietary magnesium, they calcify. If you increase their magnesium in the diet, you can see the calcification goes away. Also, if you administer the magnesium chloride interbrotoneal, you see that calcification goes away. This is five, six nephrectomized rat model. So they induce um, advanced chronic kidney disease model. And as you can see, magnesium can inhibit the calcification. So higher phosphorus, Lower magnesium is associated with more calcification. Magnesium inhibits the phosphate-induced cardiovascular calcification in CKD, not only in animal model, but also in human model in vivo and in vitro. So you can see the secondary calcium protein particle induce a lot of cardiovascular calcification, primary calcium protein particle is not uh, injurious to our cardiovascular system and maturation of primary to secondary calcium protein particle happen either because of excess phosphate or lower magnesium that increase the calcification. This is just a background. What about studies? We have now several randomized clinical trial with very good evidence and CKD patients prior to dialysis and also on dialysis that a higher magnesium or magnesium administration to our patients improve their 
outcome, improve their cardiovascular health, decrease the cardiovascular calcification. This is one study was published a couple of years ago. The random CK division prior to the analysis of so CK division stage three and four, the random 63 patient to a magnesium oxide and another 60 patient were controlled. And as you can see here, they did um, cardiovascular calcification score by multi-slice CT, they used the Agaston score. So these are the control. They gained more CAC, they, they gained more coronary artery calcification with time. Uh, this is two years follow-up um, study. Patients who received the magnesium, they have minimal increase or no increase in their calcification score. And they divide the patient with significant coronary artery calcification, uh, more than 400, and they compare it to patients with a mild or moderate uh, coronary artery calcification with a gastron score of less than 400. As you see here, magnesium oxide decreased the progression of CAC, coronary artery calcification in both groups. And the one of the interesting group, what we call it the rapid progressors, the patient who have higher increase in coronary artery calcification over time. This means they gain more than 15% annual change in their coronary artery calcification. Also magnesium oxide inhibited and it decreased this rapid progressor. Um, you know, so it was very helpful to um, not enhance at least the coronary artery calcification. However, when it comes to the aortic calcification in the thoracic aorta, it didn't help the calcification. Again, this might also augment the argument that it suppress the phosphorus and the calcium um, induced cardiovascular calcification that's particularly happened to our CKD patients. So it didn't affect it because mainly the aortic calcification happened um, because of the traditional risk factors, the non-CKD uh, MBD risk factor for atherosclerosis like smoking, obesity, dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, insulin resistance, and other risk factors. What about the dialysis patients? For dialysis patients, it's very easy to control magnesium because in our dialysate fluid, we can control the magnesium. So in this study, they run them 59 patients, either to a dialysate magnesium, of one milli equivalent per liter, which is the standard that we use in most of our dialysis patients. And they put another arm with a higher dialysate magnesium, two milli equivalent per liter. And they followed this vision only for 28 days. You see that the uh, arm who received the higher dialysate magnesium, they have higher serum magnesium levels. And more importantly, the T50 is the time to crystalline and to calcify the sample was prolonged. So the magnesium had inhibitory capacity of the serum against the maturation of the CBP, the calcium protein particle. It was a randomized clinical trial that showed magnesium can inhibit calcification, can prolong the time for calcification in this dialysis. Patients. Of course, after stopping the higher uh, dialysate magnesium, um, again, this time went down to baseline and the uh, uh, serum magnesium level went down again. In a post hoc analysis that was published uh, last year, they also compared the total uh, calcium protein particle to the amorphous forms of calcium protein particle and the crystalline form, so the primary and secondary CBP. Then, as you can see here, the higher magnesium, you know, the alizate magnesium group, they have lower CBP in, in, in general, lower CBP1 and CBP2, and more important, importantly, the CBP2 to the total CBP ratio was down in this vision. Not only that, but also the inflammatory markers went down in patients who received higher magnesium in the dialysis. So you see the tumor necrosis factor alpha and the interleukin 
six went down in the higher than zinc magnesium group. And when it comes to bone, they did also bone turnover markers, bone specific alkaline phosphatase and trap 5B. As you can see here, the bone specific alkaline phosphatase, which is a biomarker of bone formation, went up in the higher dialysate magnesium group. And the TRAB 5B, which is a biomarker for bone resorption, went down in the higher dialysate magnesium group. This means that this might, the higher you know, dialysate magnesium might improve bone formation and suppress bone resorption, which is probably good for our dialysis patients. Another 24 week open label randomized clinical trial to dialysis patients. So this is a longer uh, follow-up period. And they give, uh, they didn't increase the dialysate magnesium, but they give oral magnesium oxide to 41 patients and control it to 43 control. Of course, patients who received Magnesium oxide had higher serum magnesium level, but also very important, you see the T50 uh, went down in these patients who uh, uh, didn't get magnesium oxide. So this means that the calcification was higher, was faster in the control group. So the T50 went down from 280 minutes to 234 minutes in the cohort of patients who receive magnesium oxide, the T50 went a little bit up from 289 to 317. So again, another evidence, clinical evidence, that the administration of magnesium, not only in the dialysate, but also oral magnesium can suppress cardiovascular calcification. You might say maybe the magnesium did that because it's, it has uh, phosphate lowering uh, effect. It actually, it is a phosphate binder, but this happened regardless of the change of the serum phosphate. There was no significant change or change in the serum calcium because we discussed that the magnesium can suppress the BTH and can decrease the calcium level, but this didn't happen in this cohort of patients. So this, you know, the improvement of cardiovascular calcification uh, happened independent uh, of phosphate, calcium, and BTH. So it seems this, uh, there is a direct relationship between magnesium and calcification. So here also in this study, they showed that people who had significantly higher magnesium level, it correlated with uh, prolongation of the T50 and decreased cardiovascular calcification. So very, very good evidence, not based on animal or experimental study, not based on association uh, studies, but on trials, randomized clinical trials showed that if we increase the magnesium uh, to our patient, uh, it uh, might decrease the cardiovascular calcification. The second outcome uh, that we are going to talk briefly on is the relationship between magnesium and mortality. We all know that higher phosphorus is, has a linear association with a higher mortality. But this happened only in patients with a low magnesium level. If you compare or you know, repeat the experiment with patients with a magnesium, little bit higher magnesium level, 2.7 to 3 milligram per deciliter, you see that there is flattening of this relationship between phosphorus, serum phosphorus level and mortality. If you increase magnesium more to 3.1 milligram per deciliter or higher, there's complete flattening. So the higher phosphate doesn't affect the mortality if you improve the serum magnesium level. This is a Japanese uh, uh, Society of Dance and Transplantation National Database. And this was done on more than 142,000 uh, Japanese patient, see lower serum magnesium level is associated with higher mortality. Again, also higher magnesium level, especially when it goes more than three milligram per deciliter, it might also increase mortality, but you see the mortality is much, much higher 
with lower serum magnesium level compared to higher levels. Again, what is the reason for this increased mortality? They showed that it might be because of increased MI, which is mainly in CKD patient happened because of the cardiovascular calcification. And also there is a risk of increasing heart failure. However, it didn't affect the stroke rate, cerebral infarction or cerebral hemorrhage. So there is association between um, better survival, lower mortality, and magnesium levels. What about magnesium and CKD? So if we give more magnesium, do we have evidence that the CKD might have slower progression? So here, this is um, another um, you know, good study for uh, diabetic patient, patient with type two diabetes, 144 CKD patients with, with diabetes. And as you can see here, lower serum magnesium level was associated with higher rate of progression of the CKD and starting urinary replacement therapy or transplantation. So hypomagnesemia was associated with 2.12 higher fold of progression of end-stage kidney disease. We know that higher phosphorus is associated with you know, rapid progression of the CKD, but this happened only in case of lower magnesium. So here is a cohort of patients with high phosphorus, but they have high magnesium. There is no effect. The odds ratio or the hazard ratio is one. So there is no significant increase of risk of progression because of the hyperphosphatemia. However, in this cohort of patients with low magnesium, but high phosphorus, they have higher uh, rate of progression. The odds ratio and hazard ratio is almost doubled in this patient only if the magnesium level is high. You see this patient with high magnesium and low phosphorus, you know, high magnesium didn't really help much to decrease the um, progression, but it helped with patients with higher phosphorus. So the problem happened, and if only hyperphosphatemia happened in the presence of low magnesium level. This is a hemianephrectomized CKD mice model. So they did uh, have um, nephrectomy uh, for um, these um, rat mice. And uh, this is a six weeks experiment. And they tried to see if when they induce, uh, you know, this CKD model, uh, what will happen if they put these mice on a low magnesium or normal magnesium in intake. So people who had lower, you know, the, the mice who had lower um, magnesium intake, they have lower alpha clotho and they have more interstitial fibrosis and tubular injury if they are on a high phosphate diet. So again, lower magnesium was associated with more interstitial fibrosis and tubular injury. Another nice study that they tried to see the relationship between the, these tertiles of patient depending on their serum magnesium. The lowest tertiles, the serum magnesium was less than 1.2 milligram per deciliter to um, another group with intermediate serum magnesium 1.2 to 2.3 and the, the third group uh, with a magnesium level of more than 2.3. And they examined the relationship between these patients with different levels of serum magnesium and the progression to end-stage kidney disease and hospitalization. As you can see here, group three, this one with higher magnesium, they have lowest rate for end-stage kidney disease and they have the lowest hospitalization. Group one, which is dark here, uh, they have the highest rate of hospitalization and rare replacement therapy, and this is probably because they are hypomagnesemic. So when it comes to calcification, very, very strong evidence uh, and associations, and uh, also uh, causation that higher magnesium inhibits cardiovascular calcification. 
When it comes to mortality and progression, there is association study. It's not causation. So the evidence is not very strong what's there. Last thing is the magnesium and the bone and the BMD and the fracture risk. And here we have the least evidence. In this Japanese, uh, again, registry national database on more than 113,000 patients, you see the relationship between serum, magnesium, and the hip fracture. So um, if the serum magnesium is low, the risk of hip fracture is higher. And they adjusted, you know, in univariate and multivariate analysis, they adjusted to these all covariates. Another study, uh, it's actually from America, and it's uh, they tried to see the relationship between post in post menopausal American woman in 73,000, the relationship between magnesium intake and the BMD. So higher magnesium intake more than 422 in this uh, quantile, which is dark, compared to low magnesium intake here in this column, the light gray, you see there is significant difference in the BMD. So patients who received higher magnesium have higher BMD, especially in whole body and for the hip. However, interestingly, and this is study to make things complicated, they found that the patient who were taking higher magnesium intake, they have higher risk of lower arm and uh, wrist fracture. And they also has higher risk of fall. They explained that because these patients are probably more active. So they have this uh, higher uh, risk of fall that induce lower arm and wrist fractures. This is actually to make things more complicated, uh, the relationship between magnesium and bone. This is a population-based nested case control study from Taiwan on more than uh, 1.1 million of CKD patients in, in their national database. They compared 44, more than 44,000 patients, CKD patients who had a uh, history of hip fracture and they compared it to another uh, 44,000 with no history of fracture, and they match, they did a matched control for this uh, patient. Then they tried to find a relationship between magnesium uh, intake and the magnesium containing antacid and the exposure to this magnesium and the risk of hip fracture. And as you see here, patient who received more magnesium had higher risk of fracture again. Uh, they tried to adjust for steroid and BBI usage and they found the same effect. So again, the data regarding the fracture risk and magnesium, it's very controversial. I cannot say it's good or bad to the bone yet. Here is a problem. Do we have a genus phase of magnesium? Does magnesium uh, inhibit vascular calcification and prevent cardiovascular events? and improve survival. But if the patient have pre-existing bone disease, does it inhibit mineralization and induce mineralization defect and uh, uh, induce osteomalacia then can cause a skeletal pain and fracture? The negative effect of magnesium on bone might be enhanced in presence of pre-existing bone pathology, especially in patients who have low uh, turnover bone disease or a dynamic bone disease or a slow mineralization. But in patients without pre-existing bone pathology, this might be the case. So to summarize, um, magnesium is very essential, pivotal um, mineral in our body. It prevents the calcium protein particle maturation uh, to secondary forms and prevent hydroxyapatite formation. It reduces calcification propensity. It decreases the phosphate absorption from the gut, so it prevents cardiovascular calcification. It inhibits osteogenetic transformation and differentiation of the vascular smooth muscle cells. It inhibits the endothelial dysfunction and improve endothelial function and also inhibits the bone morphogenic protein to expression. It suppresses the BTH, 
And when you suppress the BTH, it, it might inhibit osteoclastic bone resorption and stimulate osteoblast activity. However, it can delay and prolong the mineralization and induce mineralization defect. So what is the take home message? Magnesium is very essential and magnesium deficiency is not uncommon in CKT patients. Magnesium is a potent cardiovascular calcification inhibitor, very good evidence for that. Hypomagnesemia is associated with higher mortalities. Hypomagnesemia is associated with rapid um, progression of the CKD. Again, this two end points, the progression of CKD and the mortality are just association study. It doesn't mean that when you improve the serum magnesium level or you give extra magnesium, you're going to improve the survival or slow down the progression. However, we need more study to examine the effect uh, of magnesium on this outcome. When it, it comes to bones, there is still, I cannot, you know that this is my area of interest, but so far we don't have good evidence that magnesium is um, good for, for the bone. However, it might be maybe hypomagnesemia, hypermagnesemia, both are injurious. Maybe in patient with mineralization defect or uh, adynamic bone disease or low turnover bone disease, it's, it's, uh, it's bad. So we need to figure this out. We need more studies. Improving magnesium deficiency is a potential target to improve our CKD outcome, especially when it comes to cardiovascular calcification and improving patient survival. And I will stop by here. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your invitation. And as we know, knowledge is of no value unless you put it into practice. And the great aim of education is not the knowledge itself, but the action. Please feel free to contact me. This is my email address if you have any questions or concerns. And thank you again.